Wally, thanks for uh, for having me up and appreciate the opportunity to come out tonight or this this afternoon and, and talk to everybody. And uh, I, I think it's pretty unique what a small world we've got. Uh, I was sitting in this room uh, 15 years ago, almost to the day, with many of the people that are here uh, when we were talking about uh, the Southern Pine Beetle outbreak and what in the world we were going to do and how bad it was. And now we find out probably five years after that, it was probably pretty good for our forest because we got a lot more landowners interested in management and being active participants instead of just standing by and watching their forest grow. And I was here, uh, luckily I was working with Mike Black at the time. Wally, he hired me. I, I don't know why he didn't hire you, but he hired me. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a really good good situation. We, we've come together with a lot of unique partners. Uh, and we tend to come back together uh, and, and readdress these issues time and time again from different approaches. And the one thing that I always like to see is when we all get in a room together and we're always talking about forestry, what's the one common concept that we have? It requires some type of management. You know, growing forest is not sitting on your hands and waiting for the trees to grow. You, you need to be an active participant in your forest. So Wally asked me to talk a little bit about uh, our Farm Bill programs and what we have available to landowners. Uh, a lot of you are resource professionals that are in the room today, but I don't think there's a single one of you who doesn't know a landowner who, by the end of my presentation, you might have somebody in mind and go, maybe I need to go talk to Joe or Larry or, or Sue about entertaining the idea of going to NRCS and seeing if they can help. And, and that's what I want to do is just put some of these ideas out here in concepts, show you some of the opportunities that we have as an agency uh, to be able to help private landowners. <coughs> and then I have a picture of Wally when he was a long time ago long time ago, but uh, he was one of the best private lands guys and still one of the best guys in, in the state to work with. Uh, Tennessee is a very unique state. Uh, we're the most biodiverse inland state in the country. Uh, we've got over 325 fish species, 460 mollusk species. You go down the list, we've got it. I laugh at some of my counterparts um, in Kentucky. It's our sister state to the north. You know, and I asked them, I said, how many threatened and endangered species you got? And they, they can count them literally on like one hand. And, and maybe, a, well, maybe they have to take a shoe off too to count them all. But Tennessee, we've got over 900 state and federally listed species. We have to deal and we have a lot of impact with threatened and endangered species. We have to work around it. Uh, or work, I'd look at it as an opportunity to work and create more habitat, not, so, not, a, not as a problem. Of course, we've seen something similar to this map all day long, our historic range um, for shortleaf. Of course, the things in green doesn't mean that's the only place shortleaf grows. That's just predominantly where it was found. Believe it or not, we can have shortleaf in Lake County. It will grow there. It's just not going to be very persistent. It's not going to have a good thriving population. Uh, the picture there in the background, that's at uh, Pushmata in Oklahoma. It's one of the best research sites I've been on for prescribed fire and short leaf. If you ever have a chance to go look at that, please get in a truck, drive out there, spend some time. Uh, one of the best oak, pine, short leaf areas um, in the country to really to learn what they're doing with fire on the landscape. But you can't tell if you're in Cumberland County or, or Oklahoma just by looking at that picture. Uh, <coughs> NRCS, we're trying to get more involved with forest management in our programs, and there's a reason why. Our forests make up over half of our land base in the state. Predominantly, NRCS, the Soil Conservation Service, as we were formerly known, we always work with crop producers, cattle producers, uh, nursery people, but we didn't always work with forestry people. Uh, and what's happening? Well, we're only working with one hand tied behind our back. We're not working with the majority of the landowners in the state if we're not working with our forest landowners. This is kind of an older slide, but I think it shows the importance of, of, of what the economy in Tennessee has. Look at us. We were in uh, approximately in 2003, Tennessee was number two in hardwood production. Kentucky number six, or Kentucky number five, Missouri number six. You can go down the list. Forest and forest management is really important in the state of Tennessee. And if we're not working with our customers, 
who own forest lands, we're, we're really behind the eight ball. Habitat loss is a big issue, and a lot of people say, well, why in the world is NRCS worried about habitat loss? They're a soil and water conservation agency, but we're also working with wildlife and forestry. Um, <coughs> you can see some of the, uh, you can read the numbers, you can look at the graphs, and I'm kind of one of these people, I'm, I'm a visual person. If you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, the southeast region housing density projected for 2030. Well, this was done, uh, created in about 2000. Guess what, we're over halfway. We're halfway to 2030 right now. Uh, so the red area you see in the maps is where we expect people and urbanization to occur. Well, what, what does that really matter? You know, they're not affecting my woods. Well, in fact, they are. What happens when we start making an increase in, in creating more houses on the landscape? We create more of an impermeable surface. When we get the impermeable surfaces, we start having runoff issues, water quality degradation issues. Um, and who always gets the blame for that? Uh, it's the cow people, it's the row crop people, it's never the houses, it's never the subdivision that I live in. You know, it didn't cause any problems. So a lot of times the unfair blame goes to places that it shouldn't be blamed on, uh, but ultimately, all the water, as they say, flows downstream, and we all live downstream of somebody. <coughs> well, the same thing happens with forests. When we don't have people managing their forests, uh, we start to have issues. We have fragmented forest lands in the state. Urbanization is causing that. We have less diversity on industrial forest land. Just as we've heard all morning, uh, we're talking about planting pure stands of loblolly. And what happens? We cut it in 15, 20 years. And then we get a new stand of loblolly right back. So we get these monoculture stands, no biodiversity. Uh, and then we have other things like grazed woodlands. And probably my biggest pet peeve of all, the lack of management in our forest ecosystems. People are not managing their woods. They want to hug our trees, and there's no problem with hugging it. You hug it, then you cut it down, then you put it on a truck and take it to the mill. In about two years, there'll be another one right back. You can go hug it and hug it for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and you cut it down and put it on your truck. It's okay to love your woods. Love to see them sometimes go out on the back of a truck. <coughs> How does NRCS get involved? Well, every four, five, six years, NRCS and USDA has to go before Congress, and basically what gets passed is something known as a farm bill. And there's a very small sliver of the farm bill that actually works for private landowners to put conservation on the ground. So a big chunk of the farm bill is food subsidies, and that, uh, your food stamps are all under the farm bill. But the part that goes to landowners is really a very, very, very small part of the total overall budget. Our last farm bill passed February 7th, 2014. Every farm bill gets some big fancy name, but this time it seems to be remembered by the date. I don't know why everybody remembers it by the date this time, but February 7th, 2014 was when we got our newest farm bill. <coughs> what does the farm bill do? Well, like I said, it covers a wide range of things. It goes all the way from food stamps to conservation titles, crop subsidies for row crop farmers, um, putting in water systems for, for livestock operations or planting cover crops for soil erosion. But the more number one program that NRCS has is our Conservation Technical Assistance Program. It is the best program that we have, and almost every producer, every individual who walks in the door, whether they realize it or not, they participate in our CTA program. Then we also have a program, and these are what we're most known for, and it's what we get the most no, uh, notoriety about is our fix-it program. And the Environmental Quality Incentives Program is now our fix-it program. And then we also have a group of programs commonly known as the Protect-It program. And all those fall under the Agricultural Conservation Easements Program, or ACEP. If you want to work for the government, you got to learn acronyms. And you got to be acronym proficient. Um, but I want to talk about the Conservation Technical Assistance Program just a little bit because I think that's the background and the foundation of what all our other programs work on. And one of the best things when it comes to short lease is our ability to utilize conservation technical assistance for our landowners. 
And these are free services that anybody who walks into our door and logs in to USDA's website can get access to. You're a taxpayer. Somebody's paying taxes for you, and it's a government service that's provided. One of the best services that we have, especially dealing with short leaf, um, is trying to choose sites. Conservation technical assistance, we're looking at the who, what, when, where, and why of applying our practices. Well, one of the questions that's been brought up today is site selection for short leaf. Well, we've kind of got a general guidance tool that works pretty good for picking out short leaf sites. A tool that I use a lot of times is called Web Soil Survey. How many of you in here are familiar with it? Okay, great. Web Soil Survey, you come click on the big green start button there, start Web Soil Survey, takes you into a program, and it gives you the soil characteristics uh, of a given site, and you can get acres of each soil type. One of the things about Web Soil Survey, and we've got a lot of soil scientists in the back that, that can expand on this if we need to, it's more of a landscape problem. Web Soil Survey is not designed to talk about this tenth of an acre versus that tenth of an acre. They look at things on five or 10 or 15 acre scales. So when you read a soils map, take a little bit of it with, grain of, with a grain of salt. Also look at topo maps, your aerial imageries, because some things may not exactly line up. And don't, just because it's good, in, good information, the Web Soil Surveys can have a little bit of flawed data in them. But this is an area, uh, kind of we've talked about all day today, out at Catoosa. Uh, this is Clearmount uh, Peabine Road or Fire Tower Road. Uh, and Clarence, my gosh, this is one of the, the original uh, cuts that we did on this side and on the south side of Otter Creek here. Well, this is kind of the area I want you guys to, to kind of focus on. Here's the site. This is what it looked like in 2012 approximately. Um, just some aerial imagery. Here's what happens when we run web soil survey and look at, look at, that, look at vegetation production. All of a sudden, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm a visual person. I see colors. I'm happy with colors. Colors means there's something different going on. What we have here is different soil types. The light green represents a soil type that has a certain siding depth. The blue has a different siding depth. Everything in red has a different site in depth. And then everything that's kind of ghosted out in gray, we really don't have any known site in depth to it. So what this map is telling me is based on the soil characteristics on that site, the green is the best area I have in my area of interest or what I drew a, a square around. The green area is the best short leaf soils I have the best tool in the world, but it's a whole lot better than throwing the dart out there and saying, I want to plant short leaf. Now I can kind of correlate soil function to plant growth. And this all comes down to what we're looking at here with our rating. This is basically uh, the site index. These zone wood soils has a site index of 70, um, which would have been the light green on the map. The lily at 6 to 12%. has a site index of, of 57. And so let's go back and look at our map. This green area is the best area for short leaf from a site index standpoint. The worst area that we have that they gave a site index for would be the red. And then in the middle would be the blue. If you're a visual person, this tool works great. If you're a rows and columns kind of guy, you can look it up in the growth chart. Uh, <coughs> I'm visual. But this is available for anywhere in the country, nationwide, it takes about two minutes to do. And it really will help you when you're trying to plan or work with a landowner to narrow down where potentially you need to look at short leaf. Now, these maps don't mean that short leaf won't grow here in this soil zone. It means we don't have a site index. Well, why do we not have a site index? <coughs> Probably because it's typically not grown in that, in that soil type not found naturally in that soil type. Hey, we can put it there, but it may not function the way we want it. As I talked about our conservation technical assistance, I, I need to mention one of our, our other great tools that we have, and it's field office technical guide. And if you're not been introduced to field office technical guide, 
It's a really neat tool. You can go into our national website and you can find information for any state and any county in the country. And all you really do is you come to Tennessee and you kind of break it down into a group from there. You pick on your county that you're in. You get local information for that county, local soil condition for that county. And then you also get into the big open beaker Sixteen, we call it 16 soil, which is the houses our conservation practice standards. Uh, and then there's a list of approximately 100 practices in there that we have. We have things like uh, how from tree planting to how to dig a ditch, which has a big fancy name. We have things like water control structures, how to manage wetlands, how to create wildlife habitat how to put in a dairy waste facility and everything in between. We have drawings in there. We have decision tools to try to help you decide if, if that's what you need to do. But one of the best things that I like, it gives you a standard. And a standard doesn't mean a lot to the common landowner, but the standard is the who, what, when, where, and why of applying a conservation practice. And the standards are, are uniform in the way they're set up they all have some of the same criteria. They have a name and a practice scope and a definition of what those criteria are. Those things don't mean a lot to the layman, but they mean a lot to the NRCS. Things like what is the definition? The definition is pretty self-explanatory. Establishing wood extent by planting seedlings or cutting to rope seeding or natural regeneration. And then it goes into the purpose. Why you would want to do this practice. Why would you want to plant trees? Forest pro products, such as timber, pulpwood, et cetera, wildlife habitat, the list goes on and on and on. So it gives the general person an idea of what a practice is and where it's going to be applied and how to apply it. Some of the other things that are in our conservation technical assistance that's available directly to landowners are things like implementation sheets. They used to be called job sheets several years ago. Here's one of our job sheets uh, for uh, forest stand improvement, non-commercial timber. Talks about how to go pick your trees. What it kind of needs to look like. What kind of basal area do you want to take out? What kind of basal area do you want to leave? That way you kind of get an idea of what you're looking for. Uh, these are the backbone of how our agency functions and also our conservation planners. These are the things that they're held accountable to when they're applying a practice on your property or working with you to plan. They have to make sure they use the right standard they fill out job sheets, and those job sheets are, are simplistic things to hand to you as a landowner so that you can go implement whatever practice that, that you're applying for. Now, one of the requests that we get a lot, and we talked about this earlier, you know, who are our, our customers and what do people want to do with smart roofs? Well, the objectives of our NRCS customers, most of the time, the first one that, that comes up in their objective, and this kind of aligned with Wayne and what he was talking about, is wildlife and recreation. Those are the two things that are driving people into our offices and ask about short leaf or, or anything related to forestry. Timber production is third, sometimes fourth, but sometimes it's not even on the list. People are not so driven by dollars. If they were, everybody would have a forest management plan and everybody would be implementing their forest management plan because that's how you make money in timber. A lot of people don't have forest management plans. They're not really interested in the best value that they can get for their value of their, their timber or their property. They want to enjoy it. And a lot of that is just through non-consumptive uses, such as enjoying your wood leaves. We have uh, an EQIP program. And this is kind of our fix-it program that I was talking about earlier. First, we went through our conservation technical assistance, and then we come to our fix-it program. To be eligible for forest management practices, the first thing you really got to have is you've got to have a plan. You've got to have some type of forest management plan that identifies your objectives and your management strategies. Where are you at right now and where do you want to go and how do you get there? If you don't have those concepts or don't know exactly what you want to do, don't worry, NRCS is there. We actually have cost share programs to help you get a forest management plan written and we'll pay a, per, a payment rate for getting that implemented. So if you don't have a, a practice or, I mean, a plan, that's okay. We're going to walk you through the process of getting a plan first 
and getting a plan developed for you and your farm and your objectives, then we'll worry about implementing practices after that. If you've already got an existing plan, that's even better because we're already one step into the process. Now, your plan's going to have to have certain things in it. For NRCS, for cost share, for instance, on uh, doing PSI work in your forest, maybe you've got an, an oak shortleaf stand, and you need to take a little bit of oaks out of it to allow some more room for shortleaf to regenerate. Well, we need to know what your basal area is now, how much basal area you want to remove, and how much basal area will be left. And if we've got those type of things, then we can go ahead and go into a cost share agreement or financial assistance agreement to take out some of that wood. Whatever your plan says, basically, if it says you're supposed to remove 20 square foot of basal area, we'll pay you to move tw remove 20 square foot of basal area. If your plan just says you need to go thin your woods, then that doesn't give us a measurable activity. We don't know how much you need to thin to reach your objectives. And that's where having a quality detail plan really comes in. We have a lot of landowners who walk in our office with a forest stewardship plan. Those plans are great, but they really don't have the details in them that we need to be able to provide financial assistance. But if you have a implementation plan, maybe from TDF, that may give you the details that you need. A lot of our forest management plans will have the details that, that you need. But once you get a plan developed, then there's items hopefully in your plan that align with what we're paying on with financially assisted practices that year. Our list changes from year to year. We don't always pay for the same thing last year as what we're paying for this year. We try to address things. Sometimes we run into problems. Sometimes we don't know what we're doing. Believe it or not, our agency sometimes makes some mistakes and we pay for something one year and they went, no, we shouldn't have paid for that. We, we, we kind of messed that up. <laughs> so we'll take it off the list until we know how to handle it technically and make sure we understand the technical side of it and how it's implemented. And then once we understand the technical side, we'll put it back on our payment bill. The thing that I want to recommend is if you want to start working in your forest and, and use NRCS for technical and financial assistance, come to us as soon as you have an inkling that that's what you want to do. Because it's going to take us anywhere from two weeks to two years to get you where you need to be where we can start financially assisting you in practices. Typically, it's going to take anywhere from six months to a year to get you to that point. <coughs> in our fix-it programs, we have a bunch of standards that, and practices that we apply, but under those practices is more of this subset group. These are treatments that we do in forest. Forest stand improvements, uh, riparian buffers, which is planting trees along waterways or sensitive areas, brush management, herbaceous root control. One of our favorites, fencing livestock out of the woods. Uh, maybe you have a forest operation, you need a stream crossing to get your wood out safely and not cause environmental problems by putting pollutants in the stream. We can help you with that. Tree and shrub planting. One of my favorites, prescribed burning, more pre-commercial thinnings, uh, invasive species, eradication. Edge feathering is more of a wildlife practice. It's not a production type practice. Uh, a new one that's kind of coming about, and I had a call this week, uh, actually up here in Cumberland County, silver pasture, where we're actually grazing in these forest grasslands. <coughs> and also uh, forest blade closure, where if you've had a timber operation in the past, best thing we can do is go in and close that road down correctly so that it doesn't cause erosion issues, doesn't cause water quality issues. We get it closed down, seeded down. We don't have issues in the future. Uh, one of the, my favorite ones that we've done several of these projects, uh, we called them oak savannas. This is before short term or short leaf became a buzzword. Now we're, we're having a pine oak savanna. We're going to jump on the bandwagon a little bit here. Uh, but this lower picture is actually out at Catoosa. Some of the, well, that was probably from seven or eight years ago, the big grassland savannas. Um, the upper picture, can anybody tell me the difference between the two of those? Probably don't have a clue. But basically, the lower picture was after about three or four dormant season burns at Catoosa. The upper picture you can tell it's still smoking. Uh, went out to Oklahoma and did some burning. But that is a research uh, site 
that at that time had 19 years of annual bonus. We changed the plant community through the burning. Um, we changed the plant communities on both these sites through, through burning, but definitely the upper picture is much more dramatic than this lower picture. Um, and one of the things we like about Savannah, it kind of creates the best of both worlds. You have a grassland forb component along with a woody component. You've got woods and you've got grass. You don't have one or the other. <coughs> a lot of the habitat work and, and a lot of the short leaf restoration, if we're going to maximize it, we're also going to have to introduce fire back into the system. Um, and how we're going to do, do that, well, one is education. With education, I think it's one of the most important things we're doing. And I've been really fortunate. I've got an Oak Savannah site uh, down in Sequatchie County um, that we've been working with for about five years. And one of the best things we've been able to do is get the UT system and the UT students involved with prescribed burning on these Oak Savannahs. They come out during their classroom time, spend a day, and burn with us. We've got about 25 students now that are not afraid of fire, have actually implemented fire on their landscape, and see it as a beneficial tool. Um, plus, they find some pretty unique things, and we all hope. <coughs> I really have to question sometimes when I put this one in here, but this, this, this is a TDF forester, and I have to hide his identity because he's ashamed of what he does, and he goes to rehab occasionally. We caught him kind of uh, relapsing, set the woods on fire. We know it, it is bad that you don't burn hardwood, right? Well, he's, he's going through remission right now, and I'm going protect to his, protect his identity unless he wants to stand up in the back back there because <laughs> he's got a really big grin on his face. Uh, but hopefully this spring he won't have a relapse again, but it tends to be every April or May he tends to have a relapse. He sets more hardwoods on fire, and believe it or not, the woods are still there. Uh, overall message, prescribed fire is okay, just as we said this morning. The wildfires are what we have problems with. We've got to educate our communities uh, and the general public about that. This is one of the cost shared activities that NRCS has. The only way to put fire on the landscape a lot of times is to help people implement it, whether through financial assistance or through our technical assistance. Down to the meat and potatoes. What does NRCS do for short leaf? These are our numbers for last year under our Equip Fix-It program. Uh, basically, uh, the Cumberland Plateau area, we spent about $82,000 on forest management activities, $68,000 uh, statewide on planting short leaf, and then about $222,000 statewide in getting plans developed for landowners and implementing forest management activities. We worked with about 80 different landowners last year for $375,000 in the forest management work, um, which is not bad, specifically when we have very limited participation. One of the newest things that we've got going on is a partnership between NRCS, Trail Forever, and PWRA. We now have a Trail Forever Farm Bill biologist working just with Short Leaf Pine here on the plateau. Um, glad to have him on board. It's a great opportunity for us to work with more people have a dedicated person to work short leaf. How do we get things going? NRCS is begging. Literally, I'm begging for people, people that you guys know, to come in and want to work with us on managing their timber and their wildlife. And those two go hand in hand. Tell them to come by your local office and ask that you that, to get involved with timber management and managing their woods. Now we always got the burning question. <laughs> Where do I get more information? Well, it's pretty simple. Everybody knows how to Google, and if you can Google in NRCS, Tennessee. If you do, it'll bring you to our local or our state website uh, where you can get more information. If you don't want to go to the government website, we can go to TWRA. We have a great resource. You can come and click, go to TWRA's website, go to Habitat Protection. Here is all your information. If you'll click on region one, two, three, or four, You'll get an alphabetical list by county in that region of every contact that you will ever need from a resource professional dealing with wildlife or forest conservation or even conservation people. It'll have your extension agent, your extension division of forestry numbers. It'll have your NRCS office number, your soil conservation district, your TWRA biologist, uh, all those information county by county. If you can't remember how to get to, if you 
can't find the information on Google in this little survey. Uh, if you can't get through any one of those, feel free to call me. I'll steer you in the right direction. I'll try to give you uh, several opportunities uh, to get with people. <coughs> and you can get a hold of me at Cookville uh, on the USDA website or just uh, face it and, and Google me and then I'll show you some information. But one of the things I'm most proud of is implementing on, with landowners and, and trying to get things going on private land. But I can't do a lot of private lands work without having some type of fence works. And I really got Pat Wally on the back because he's taken one of the small W names uh, that we've got in chemistry and is changing the landscape. Bill, Bill another uh, manager who has changed the landscape, trying to provide something new and different for habitat, something new and different for, for wildlife species, and more importantly, just giving an opportunity for Fort Worth to come into your, your mind. And, and hats off to both of you guys because you're actually not just sitting there screaming, I need to do more, but you're actually out there doing more. So with that, I'll be quiet.